Hi, and welcome to the Fair Perspectives podcast, the official podcast of the pro-human movement, brought to you by the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism. I'm your host, Melissa Chen, and my co-host, who you will hear from shortly, is Angel Eduardo. Today, we speak with Thomas Chatterton Williams, who is the author of Losing My Cool and Self-Portrait in Black and White. He is a contributing writer at the New York Times Magazine, a columnist at Harper's Magazine, and is a Hannah Arendt Center Senior Fellow and Visiting Professor of Humanities at Bard College. His work has appeared in The New Yorker, The London Review of Books, Le Monde, and many other places. In this episode, we discuss his opposition to identity categories, the ethnic and cultural valence of Black identity, the cultural challenges of abandoning race and racialized language, Islamism in France, and the French approach to race policy. We also survey the current landscape of the backlash against critical race theory, the effectiveness of anti-CRT bills sweeping the nation, and debate the relative merits and faults of the Christopher Rufo strategy. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Thomas Chatterton Williams. Thomas Chatterton Williams, this is an honor, my man. I'm so happy to have you on Fair Perspectives. Thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure, man. Thanks for having me on. Thank you, Melissa. Yeah, so I... I particularly have been kind of chasing you for years. I don't know if it feels like 10,000 years ago now, but we met in New York briefly when you were on your book tour for Self-Portrait in Black and White on Learning Race. Uh, What was that? Like November, October 2019? It was like... Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. So, you know, the world ended right after that. So it seems like forever ago. quiet for a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and I guess the best place to start is kind of, you know, since so much has happened since then. Um, but regarding that book, you know, you talked a lot about the book and, you know, what made you write it and the thought process that went into it. But I'm curious if if you've evolved at all in your thinking about the things that you tackle in the book, about, you know, unlearning race, about abandoning the concepts. You know, this is something that I've been doing kind of actively, and I'm now sort of a militant anti-race person. Yeah, you're one of the soldiers on Twitter.com about this. You're you're a real <laughs> ally now, along with yeah, Camille man. Foster and just a couple others. Yeah, <laughs> right. you're out there. I'm trying yeah. to I'm trying to live up to Camille now. I, I I'm really really committed to this idea of rejecting this whole thing because I think it's so harmful. But I'm wondering if if you've evolved at all or what your thinking is on that sort of thing now. Well, if I've evolved on on that specifically. It's that um, I'm even more convinced that um, there's not only a dead end, but there's um, something worse than a dead end when you go down the road of um, of of doubling down on the identity categories that racism thrives on and that bigotry and prejudice thrive on, stereotyping yeah. thrives on. So I think that I'm even more convinced that we can't transcend racism so long as we um, refuse to abandon the racialized uh, thinking rooted in slavery and plantation logic that created these categories. You can't, mm-hmm. um, you can't uh, defang or rehabilitate terms that are rooted in hierarchy. You have to actually do something much harder, which is rethink how, how we um, define ourselves and each other. And, and try to create new values, try to try to create a new man, like uh, Franz Fanon said, that sounds naive and people don't want to do it. It sounds too hard. But yeah. um, what I've seen in the past two years of the racial reckoning and the recommitment to a kind of very close to something like a racial essentialism, um, I know that that's not going to be the solution. We're not going to get to the society we say we want to achieve uh, going that way. And we've never right. tried the way of actually abandoning or abolishing race. So people think it's naive, but it's never been even attempted. Right. But, you know, the pushback that I get all the time uh, as I'm in this sort of, you know, this space kind of pushing for this sort of thing is, well, one of them is that there's a, there's a really tricky kind of uh, spaghetti ball that we've created where, you know, what do we call people like you besides black, right? Like, you know, calling you African-American people kind of balk at that. Like, why should I be hyphenated? And that's perfectly valid. You know, there's, there's a kind of, there's a thing that the racial category has, uh, there's a spot that the racial category has taken 
that now we would have to sort of figure out a way to replace. So, you right. know, it's a, it's a shorthand. You don't have to actually do the much harder thing of uh, thinking through complicated issues uh, right. with, with, with fresh eyes and ears. Um, can you think with eyes and ears? You don't have to think through <laughs> complicated problems um, yeah. anew. You can kind of take this received way of interpreting the world that is not um, as old as we kind of think. It's only a few centuries old, but you know it seems like it's a permanent fixture of our reality. We can just rely mm -hmm. on that, you know, these, these ready-made categories and, and frameworks. Um, and it's a lot harder to actually like meet individuals and not see them through the veil of race and identity, but actually um, encounter them as people uh, distinct unto themselves. Um, yeah. It's a lot harder. So I think it, it makes sense to me why people want this shorthand. And what do you call people that, you know, that look like they should be slotted into certain categories? What do you call them? Isn't it easier just to embrace the kind of problematic thinking that, you know, that racism thrives on? Because how else would we do this? I mean, I think you have to do two things at once. Our brains are wired to, uh, you know, produce stereotypes and to search for shortcuts, but we can also resist that. We don't have to be captive to all of the wiring. You know, we, we, we constantly try to transcend the limitations of our, you know, of our natural proclivities. I think that we do it all the time. We actually do have a multi-ethnic society already in point of fact, that works pretty well. I think, you know, people can take more time to be more thoughtful about how they present themselves and kind of resist, you know, someone like Mel can just resist calling herself if she wanted to Asian American, because that abstraction is so large that it's very difficult to, you know, to accurately convey um, who she is as an individual. Um, you and I are what people call mixed, which I reject because that implies that some people are pure when we know that right. scientifically that's, a, that's, a, that's not correct. Um, but it's easier for people to say we're mixed and to think of what it means to be somebody who descends from both Europe and Africa. And, indigenous populations as you likely do as well you know um, right, yeah. but we can insist on these things and you know the more of us insist you don't actually have to have unanimity the more people you know insist that the way that the current uh discourse fails them the more that you have a kind of critical mass that i think could produce some some outcomes that would be really beneficial and i, I actually am really optimistic i think that we will get there i think that too many yeah. people know that the way we make race and remake race every day this racecraft, it's not working. No, I, you're, you're, you're right in terms of, you know, I've said this before, that I didn't actually know I was Asian until I moved here to the United States. Um, being born and bred in, in Singapore, I was classified as Chinese, right? Because it's more granular there. So mm -hmm. be, just because of just how it works. Um, so you have Chinese, Indian, Malays. That was the category. And I just never really, you know, heard the term Asian to, to that, that I was supposed to identify with until I, I moved here. Um, and and it's it's very interesting when your cultural context shifts, right? Because you you see all these categories are actually just very fluid. I'm sure you've written about that a lot about uh, and also about how um, your experience living in France has given you a whole mm -hmm. different perspective on race. And in particular, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, like, but France um, maintains a, a very strict colorblind uh, racial policies, and and citizens are not asked to identify uh, by identities that. Uh, by like racial identity, is that, is that correct? That is correct. Uh, officially, France doesn't recognize race um, okay. and they don't keep statistics on it. And, you know, this is ultimately, I think, where you would have to say you would want society to, to get to. But of course, in practice, in the reality of 2022, it produces its own problems because France still has um, actual racism in the society. It's not a society that has transcended a, identity. Um, so you have situations hmm. that people bring up all the time, like you can't tell, you know, what's going on in the criminal justice system. You can intuit that um, there's some bias there, but you don't have numbers of how many Arabs are in jail because um, everybody in jail is just a French citizen, for example. And we know that there is anti-Arab bias. So these things aren't perfect, but I think that, you know, if you would have to just choose ideally, which system would you prefer on paper, the French way of being officially colorblind and adhering to a kind of Republican ideal that says everyone is equal as a citizen and you as um, a Catholic or you as a Jew or you as a Muslim, you, you, you have every right to that in your private 
sphere, but in public, you're a French citizen. You would have to say that's better than the kind of hyphenated, balkanized um, identity politics game and skin game that we're stuck in in America. Even though I think that on the ground, one of the paradoxes is that on the ground in America, even though on paper, I think we have a worse way of kind of fetishizing identity difference. On the ground, we actually live with each other um, more and better than, than, than Europeans do. Mm. Well, you know, what do you think about, uh, we definitely want to talk about kind of your, your perspective being in France and kind of still being tuned into American culture and politics. But, but before that, I, I want to, I want to ask, because what do you think about people who say, you know, kind of getting back to what we were just talking about, you know, like someone like Greg Thomas, for example, you know, he uses the, the term black. Yeah. So he, he uses the term black Americans to describe the ethnicity and he, you know, he capitalizes the B and, and it's, he, he distinguishes between the racial category of black and this ethnic category that he's decided to, to use called black American. That seems to me to be kind of dangerously walking the line. Like you're, you're, you're just always on the edge of going back and essentializing, or at least having people understand it that way. What do you think about that? Do you think that there's any way to square that sort of stuff? Or is it just too sort of uh, intellectually dangerous? No, I do. I mean, I think you have to be very deliberate about how you um, conceive of these things. But, you know, I don't capitalize the B in a color because uh, I don't think you can make a case that uh, is pretty, is convincing of why you would do it for one, but not the other. Why would you capitalize only black, but not white? And then if you capitalize both, why are you color capitalizing color categories that comprise many different ethnic groups? So I just leave it. I leave both uncapitalized as we, as we did until uh, 2020. <laughs> right. um, but, but, you know, but I do, think that there are real cultural contexts that people exist in and emerge in, emerge from and can move in and out of. And, you know, I think that um, Black American cultural traditions are distinct from uh, monolithic racial Blackness that links a Jamaican with a Nigerian, with a South African, with 13th generation Black American from Alabama. I mean, whatever racial essence is supposed to link all these people that have profoundly different life experiences, I reject that. But I do think there's a kind of, you know, black cultural tradition that's produced, you know, tangible um, products like music and and kind of style of dress and a way of speaking that um, you don't have to deny or refuse to participate in any more than somebody would not participate in Italianness or in, you know, Jewishness. These things don't have to be um, thought of as having any basis in blood and skin you know, it's, 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 it's something that we create and choose to create. And the black American tradition, you know, I think what Greg, if I can imagine what he's thinking, of, he's thinking of the very real fact that the black American tradition, along with a kind of Northern Yankee Protestant tradition and a native American tradition is really like one of the three fundamental um, roots of the, the of the of the of the American tree that now has sprouted so many branches that are all authentic, but but it, it's fundamentally a part of American life, uh, national life, to participate in something that we call black. We used to call it Negro. We ha it has had many names, you know, and and mm -hmm. I think I probably I think that black is is the term I would use, but it's an imperfect term because a lot of people don't use it in the same way. So some people use it to mean anybody who descends from Africa anywhere on the planet. And some people use it like Greg to mean specifically American descendants of slavery. And mm -hmm. I think that a lot of the racial terminology we use is often um, made, it's, it's made messy by this kind of uh, slippage that occurs when people use the same words to mean different things. So yeah. I, I wish there was a more specific kind of uh, name we could put on um, the ethnicity that we mean when we point to people who have been in America through the institution of slavery and have yeah. created an American culture that's integral to the American project. 
Yeah, I mean, the thing is that to me, there's kind of essentialism creeping in by mistake, right? Because if you think of, you know, New York hip hop culture, right? And Mississippi Delta blues culture and like, you know, the Midwest sort of Motown culture, right? Those are all very distinct. And yeah. people are kind of lumping all of that in and saying that's black culture, right? But there's so much more. Regionalism is something that Albert Murray insisted on that I think really, you know, is very important. And whenever you try to talk about America at all, is that it, not just in terms right. of black people, but in terms of any type of American cultural context, uh, which part of America? Because, right. you know, the country is a large place that varies um, as much as you can find when you cross borders in Europe. In Western Europe, yeah, uh, it's right. really different to be on the West Coast than it is to be in the Southeast. And you know, it's the idea that everybody exists in the same uh, cultural spaces it, it also oversimplifies uh, the texture of American life. Yeah. So yeah, the thing is that you know, while I recognize that you know we want to kind of have a name for this sort of sub ethnicity of American. Um, and we want to kind of connect to that culture, it seems to me to be almost needlessly dividing us from each other, right? Because, you know, we can, we should probably just zoom out a little bit more and say it's American culture, right? And, and there are regional and then, you know, kind of local cultural and local sort of even neighborhoods, right? Because like even in New York, the five boroughs of New York, there are different accents, there are different ways of being, right? And there's different it's cultures. Very different, different to be from Staten Island than to be from Manhattan. Right. Yeah, exactly. And and there's different sorts of even music and art, right? That just kind of, it just kind of manifests itself because of this sort of, you know, these concentric circles of of culture and, and people intermingling, right? And America is unique, right? Like you were just talking about what the situation is like in France. And it is fundamentally different because of, you know, the history and because of, the the mix of ethnicities, right? Like I, you know, I'm in Queens and Queens is the most ethnically diverse concentration of people in the world, as far as I know. Like there's more different kinds of people from different places here than anywhere else in the world, right? We're concentrated in this one area. That's going to have an effect. And I think it's a uniquely American effect, right? Like, so why would we, why would we sort of compartmentalize that, right? Like I want to be I want to I want to own, you know, New York hip hop culture as much as uh, you know, kind of western bluegrass culture. And I want to you know, I want those things to all belong to me. Like Motown belongs to me. And New York hip hop belongs to me and you know, the southern blues belongs to me. And it, I don't have to have this kind of blood and skin sort of connection to it. I have a you know, a, a human connection to it. You know, so it, that's that's my thing with with uh, the whole, you know, black Americans thing. But I don't have a solution. I don't know. What do we call this this sort of sub ethnicity? Do we just abandon the whole thing? Do we abandon Italian American? Do we abandon, do we abandon you know, Russian American, Jewish American, Dominican American and just say American? Because then we we may be kind of. We may be making the opposite mistake of, of you know, not distinguishing enough. Right. And people sort of feel erased. Right. But but isn't that that's exactly what they do in France, right? With um, the the difference being that in the United States, the hyphenated model that you're talking about is is something that is um, born out of the um, multicultural approach. Versus in France, I remember I think Macron described it as universalist. Is that in France we are we are universalists and everyone is French, and so you won't make the distinction between French. Uh, I don't know, Algerian or the hyphenated French person doesn't really exist in, in, in at least on the public policy level. I, you know, Thomas was saying that um, it's kind of different in, in practice, like socially on the ground, which, which I find interesting because I feel like here you have a natural laboratory for comparing how these two policies actually, or these two approaches actually shake out um, in, in terms of, you know, what, what, you both are saying, right? Like, like getting rid of, of the, the the labels. Like, does that in any way diminish um, the rap coming out from the the banlieues, for example? I don't know if I butchered that word. <laughs> no, um, it's pretty good, <laughs> right? <laughs> no, I mean, I think that people actually 
have to have some way of organizing their sense of themselves uh, that puts them in smaller groups than can exist at the 340 million person level or the 66 million person level, if that's the size of France. Um, and I don't think that that's necessarily wrong. I mean, I think that you could fully participate in hip hop culture. First of all, you can do that just by being a human being who interests right. themselves enough. And luckily for you, I mean, Puerto Ricans, blacks and Jews were instrumental in, in, <laughs> in the foundational culture in New York. So it's always been multicultural from the beginning. It's profoundly influenced by black musical traditions. Um, you know, in, in, in France, everybody's publicly French, but privately Algerians like to cook certain things that uh, their community um, cares about more than people outside of that, you know, um, cultural context. And that's fine, too. I mean, I think that there's an expression I'm blanking on the name of the of the uh, of the Frenchman who said it. But the, the thinking is kind of like um, nothing to the to the Jew as a, as a group, but everything to the Jew as an individual. Uh, and, and, and that is, I think, you know, something that mm. sounds maybe kind of crazy and harsh, but actually makes some sense, especially if you think of the goal of being no separatism, no, you know, breakdown of one community against another, but everybody participating in a national life and then being free as an individual to, to, to identify however one so chooses and to worship and to, to do these things. And I think that that's consistent with a kind of ethnic differentiation that you're, that I think you were asking if we need to abandon. So I, I think that there's a kind of middle ground that, that would be a nice compromise between the extreme of a kind of essentialism that we're bound to, whether, whether we believe it um, addresses our own personal concerns or, or conveys the complexity of who we are well or not, and a kind of nothingness that I think most people couldn't bear, which most people would feel that they disintegrate under. Yeah. It strikes me, though, that because of this um, framing, um, it seems like, you know, whenever I hear, I think of the, the press conference that Macron made right after, I believe the teacher, Samuel Petit, was mm -hmm. uh, mur murdered, um, was very critical about, I think he, you know, had a direct quote about um, Western media's obsession with race. And in particular, he was talking about America. Um, and that caused, uh, you know, the West, he felt, should have expressed solidarity with France. But instead, there was a lot of apologia um, on behalf of, you know, the, the, the Islamist who murdered Samuel Petit. Um, and, I mean, I, I think that uh, it, it just seems that that France right now uh, is is kind of the sole, you know, bulwark against kind of these, uh, even like what you would loosely call here, given that Chris Rufo has popularized the term in this way, uh, you know, critical race theory. I know you're not a fan of the word woke, but it, unfortunately it's just such an easy way to sum up, um, you know, what we're talking about. And it's, it's pretty difficult to escape that capture right now. Um, but what are your views on 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 kind of the the state of of um, just just how much you know our institutions have been vectors of of critical race theory and kind of the differences do you do you see more resistance uh, in France versus uh, the United States? Well, I'm I'm I've been working on a piece um, trying to make a useful comparisons of the two approaches. Um, the French have become very consumed with debates over le wokeisme, which is <laughs> that's what it's called, <laughs> which has uh, entered their their vocabulary like le sandwich and things like le weekend. I, I, like, I noticed it's masculine. <laughs> yeah, it is masculine. Which I, I'm not sure if that's actually accurate. It might actually be in reality feminine, but yeah, they, they, they conjugate it in a masculine way. Um, it's interesting. Um, France is not a woke society. It's really not. So the kind of muscular response they have to problems, it doesn't necessarily feel um, natural in this context, but it's a kind of response I wish were mustered uh, by our institutions in America. And it's really interesting to compare the two. It's almost like the French play this kind of intellectual game where they say 
imagine if our society were actually woke, like how would we counter that? And then they come up with great, with great counters, but actually in point of fact, they barely have um, a kind of acceptance or tolerance in the mainstream or in elite institutions for an identity politics uh, of any sort. So it's, it's kind of, it's, it's a situation where there's some middle ground between the two countries that, that, that might be ideal. Um, American institutions have been captured and are kind of, um, I don't like to call it CRT. I think that's a really weird way that uh, this guy, Christopher Rufo started phrasing um, the problem and is kind of purposefully uh, branded um, yeah. this way. But uh, whatever is going on, you know, what Wesley Yang calls the successor ideology or wokeness or whatever we want to call it, um, it has deformed a lot of American public life. Certainly it's deformed the cultural media academic and like elite corporate spaces um if it hasn't um found its way into you know small town ohio yet um and so i think that you know i think that there are french responses to this such as you know an adherence to 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 universalism to belief in universal values that everybody participates in and universal standards i think there are responses the french uh produce that would be really beneficial for Americans to pay attention to. And so I was interviewing the, the Minister of Education, uh, Jean-Michel Blanquer, who is really one of the most prominent and controversial opponents of, of wokeness in France. And his project is to create think tanks and to create them also, not just in France, but in America, that are kind of laboratories for, for um, thinking through and developing and spreading Republican in the, in the not GOP, but Republican, um, small r, uh, values and ideas about liberalism and, uh, and, you know, and, uh, tolerance and, you know, separation of church and state, secularism, you know, these kinds of values that France, uh, prides itself on. He wants to present another model of making a multi-ethnic society work that could compete with the American model that dominates uh, social media, which actually in turn carries quite an international and global influence and kind of soft, soft uh, power, cultural imperialism uh, that, that, that actually you can see um, really uh, if, if, the, if the worries in France are a little bit um, overblown now, you can see how they're rooted in some concern that might need to be taken seriously because American soft power is so dominant and influential that you could imagine 10 years, 20 years down the line, it's not exactly the same situation we find ourselves in now. One, one distinction that it is really important to make between the French situation and the American situation, and a reason why um, the French take wokeness and the threat of identity politics so seriously, even when it seems overblown, is because they do actually have a situation with a kind of violent extremism based in Islamism, not Islam, the religion, but is militant Islamism that uh, has been spectacularly um, uh, brutal on their own soil in a way that even in a post 9-11 world, Americans don't really uh, encounter. And so they really perceive any movement towards um, a politics of identity and separation as a potential threat that ends in the ultimate form of expression of uh, identity grievance, which is decapitating somebody outside of a high school for, for, for teaching uh, free expression and for feeling that your identity gives you the right to avenge uh, on the basis of blasphemy. So that's actually, that's, it's, it's hard for, I think, Americans, and this is what was fueling the anger and frustration uh, from the French when the New York Times and other places were trying to impose a, an American white supremacist framework on, uh, on, on a debate that really is about uh, secularism and, and religious fundamentalism. Uh, this, is, this is where I think they have uh, a compelling point. I, I, remember the, uh, I remember the headlines, the New York Times headlines. There were two. They had one, and it was quick. Uh, it was quickly changed because of the uproar, right? But it was, and I wish I had them in front of you. It was something to the effect of like leading with the fact that police fatally shot 
right. This, a completely this American man. framing of what had happened. Yeah. Police shot man wielding knife, you know, like. Yeah. That makes it sound like a police overreaction or something. The, the man mm-hmm. wielding the knife had just beheaded a teacher for, for giving a lesson on the value of uh, freedom of expression. Right. I mean, it's just right. as bad as it gets. Also, very bizarrely and very upsetting to, to a lot of French people I talked to um, was the framing of France as a white society and Muslims as necessarily people of color, even though this guy was a Chechen, the killer was a Chechen uh, asylum seeker. I mean, we can debate on what people from the Caucasus mountain region are. But the idea that he represents POC um, and that non-white Frenchmen and women are somehow um, incapable of valuing freedom of expression and are fundamentally offended by that. Uh, it was a very upsetting kind of way of yeah. squeezing um, a tragedy that happened in France into an American uh, framework of identity and white supremacy that frankly doesn't fit. And Macron was really right to powerfully push back on that and say that we won't be necessarily well served by importing an American way of making an, a multi-ethnic society. We have other ideas of how to do that and we need to pursue our own sense of how this works. Um, so that, so that, those, are, those are questions I'm thinking through a lot right now. Um, and I don't think that either society is perfect, but when you compare the two, you can kind of have a, I think you can, you can gain some appreciation for what, um, for what wokeness can get right, because wokeness, there are a lot of problems with wokeness, and, and I'm a constant critic of it, but it, the idea that there are certain um, inherited ways of thinking and, and inherited ways of relating to each other from conflicts and prejudices past that continue to affect the way we interact now, and that we should become more aware of some of these things, um, that in itself is not wrong. And oftentimes, you know, an awareness of the fact that, hey, the cops really are out here, uh, you know, shooting people quite a lot disproportionately happens to be this group or that group or that group. But like, you know, we should pay more attention to this. That can be construed as woke, but it also can be something that, you know, we just need to take more seriously than maybe we did 20 or 30 years ago. Um, and, you know, in, in the French way, you can kind of see how maybe they could become a little bit more flexible and understand that principles matter, separation of church and state matters, for example, but actually going to the point of taking a 50 year old Muslim woman on the beach and forcing her to disrobe because she's wearing a burkini is taking the principle of secularism so far to the point that being a little bit more woke on that and flexible and a softer interpretation of laicite for the reality of a multi-ethnic society could, in an American way, could also, you know, could help. So I think there's an interesting dialogue to be had between the two, between the two models. Yeah, the, the French uh, version of laicite, the radical devotion to, to secularism, um, I, it just strikes me as it's going to be difficult to, um, you know, to just structurally in the United States, uh, the, you know, our commitment to the freedom of expression and freedom of religion in particular. Yeah, it couldn't happen in America. <laughs> it, it just, it just couldn't. And it, it's, it's, you know, I think this walk, walking the fine line is just so difficult because um, public versus private spaces and when your religion, you know, is, is asserted and, and when mm-hmm. there is an externality, right? Like I think, um, I think it would have been very jarring to see that clip uh, for, that, that came out of Times Square where all the Muslims were actually praying during Ramadan in public, right? In France, that probably would absolutely not be allowed. Or, or the recent clip circulating online of, of just a bunch of Christians on Easter playing, you know, worshipping on an airplane. Um, such <laughs> public dis- displays of, of religion um, in the United States is still kind of seen as, um, yeah, like, Great, you know, and especially in light of of new new ideas today about like John McWhorter's idea that well, wokeness is just another new religion. Um, you know, I, it's it's interesting to see how all these um, all these all these things kind of butt up against each other. You know, I, I think 
I think I've been kind of uh, skeptical about the the secularization project that like, okay, the more religion recedes from the United States, um, it seems like people need to adopt a new one. Um, and I, I, you know, I think, I think France is an interesting contrast to that because, you know, people just keep their religions, uh, very private. And it seems like there is a very strong muscular French identity. These are yeah. enlightened values that we hold and, and, you know, maybe because of that muscular defense of their values, it, it, they seem to be holding back a, a lot of these ideas. Like you said, not necessarily good in, in every sense. I mean, I think French, uh, France has a big problem with, uh, you know, I, th- I think colonial studies, for example, which is, you know, one of the, the woke um, branches of education here. Um, you know, I think I think it's interesting to, to interrogate French history through that lens. Um, yeah, and, very much right? so. You're you're really right because I mean, wokeness is is often really stupid and annoying. But there's an enormous amount of the French population that has zero zero understanding of French zero accurate understanding of French colonial history. Not just that believes the wrong things, but doesn't know about what France was really up to in Asia, what France was really up to even in Haiti, and getting a little bit more woke and having a more honest and full-bodied conversation, um, substantive conversation about um, the complexity of French history would actually be an improvement for society that, you know, kind of embraces um, a real, like, mythologized uh, understanding of its own past glories and really doesn't confront... uh, some of the things that uh, I think shape some of the resentments that exist in the society to this day. So that's a long way of saying that I think you're really right. Colonial history in the French context, you know, I think that, you know, pulling down statues is often really like an infantile expression of anger and resentment. But there should probably be a lot more statues in France where you, you know, the, the idea that there's not a statue of like Toussaint Louverture or, or there's not an understanding that he was a part of French history and that revolt in Haiti mattered. And we should understand what was going on and what it meant for, you know, Napoleon to re-enslave Haitians as he did. Um, and the idea that there are still many, many, many statues um, unequivocally honoring um, people who really did horrific things uh, during the colonial era. And most people who pass these statues have no idea who these people are, or what they did. You know, something has, asking society to become more aware and sophisticated in its understanding of its history, uh, not to do this thing that I really don't like in America, where we just try to go back and edit it and, and just delete things that we don't like, but but to have a serious conversation about what transpired before and who these people actually are, whose names are on all the streets. I think that that would be to the good. And and, and I find it hard to believe that anybody could just be opposed to that um, so reflexively, but that's where the conversation is. Yeah. It seems to me that almost, you know, I can kind of see easily a circumstance where what we're witnessing in France right now is a sort of (laughs) (laughs) pre-wokeness. Because because of the kind of, um, you know, I guess complacency or ignorance that you're, That's a you're good describing. Term, complacency. Yeah. Like, you know, people are sort of disinterested in that sort of thing and there is a reality there and it does matter. And, and the sort of, you know, ambivalence toward learning more about it and actually engaging with it seriously is going to create or can create a movement like what we have here in the States. That's that very will, true. And that's the fear yeah. that the opponents of wokeness have, but they don't see how forcibly denying that reckoning right. empowers the coming wokeness right. that we're in the we're in the preliminary phase of. Right. They exactly. actually strengthen it. It's like the same thing that we've already seen in America. The extremes they strengthen each other. Right. They fuel each other. Yeah. So yeah. you actually do have to have a kind of moderate, flexible middle way that it seems uh is not right. popular in either the US or in <laughs> France right now. Yeah, exactly. But it's I mean it's kind of inevitable, right? If if you refuse to have a serious oh, yeah. 
serious look at stuff and a serious conversation about these things, then you're, you know, the conversation is still going to happen and the attention is still going to be given, but without concern for the serious part, right? Without concern right. for the intelligently part of the right. thing. Like people are just going to then react. And it becomes angry. pure resentment and exactly. this backlash. And, um, you know, I, 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 I think that, yeah, I think that fears right now are overblown, but there's no telling where the culture will be in 10, 20 years, where what types of demographic shifts will influence that and the degree to which we all live, you know, on the internet, uh, increasingly on social media and the lingua franca of social media is not just English, but American social justice rhetoric. Um, I mean, that has profound ramifications that I think, you know, simply denying any validity to the claims of wokeness uh, only exacerbates. Well, you, you've you been a, a huge critic of what's going on here, the, the backlash yeah. in the United States, especially with regard to um, anti, what, what they're calling anti-CRT laws, right? Um, and I know that, you know, there was that whole uh, kerfuffle, right, after you, Kamel, and I think it was Jason Stanley and David French published the New York Times op-ed, you know, as both, as, as well, at least three of you that I know are, are huge critics of, of, of wokeness, loosely speaking, right. and, and um, yet you, you're opposing um, some of these, or I, I just the, the principle of, of, of banning CRT in schools, um, uh, you know, by law. Um, I guess this is a huge debate because it, it seems to be capturing the nation one by one every, you know, couple of months you're going to hear, oh, the state is doing this, uh, the don't say gay bill in Florida. And it just ruffles everybody's feathers. And, um, you know, now it seems like we're handing, um, we're, 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 you know, the, the kind of free speech debate is kind of, is you see it kind of turning, right? Mm -hmm. um, how do you address the, the criticism, I guess, that um, I think one of, you know, say Christopher Rufo's pushback would be um, that uh, it's not really, you can't really solve this in the marketplace of ideas. Um, this is an issue about what is taught on the public dime um, in schools. And, and, you know, for example, you will not, objects probably to the teaching of, uh, of an anti-creationism law, right, in in schools. Right? You wouldn't want your biology class to teach you alternative know that I, theories. I actually don't know that I would need a hmm. law about that. Okay. Well, but there are, exist I guess there are existing uh, laws that, that, you know, prevent teachers from proselytizing their religion in, in school. There are existing civil rights law as well that, um, and I think this was David French's point that there are existing civil rights era laws that um, prevent, you know, the kind of uh, discrimination over dis or racial discrimination mm -hmm. that, that might arise from this. So we can just rely on, on old uh, on, on, on kind of the, the legal structure that are, are already exists. Mm -hmm. But I guess how do you, you know, in, in a way that 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 it seems like K to 12 schools, I think it can be denied that there that there is a, um, you know, movement to kind of re-racialize uh, society by using mm -hmm. the institutions of education. Yeah. How do you propose that we really fight this? Do you, you know, do you really think that this is something that can be changed culturally just through conversation, just through the marketplace of ideas? I mean, I do. I think that um, bad thinking is defeated. Um, if it's going to be defeated, is defeated by better thinking and, and, and more persuasive thinking. I think you actually have to not just... Um, be right or believe yourself to be right, but you have to convince people. Um, I think that, you know, things move in cycles and there are corrections that become overcorrections and then have to be recalibrated. And I think we're in a period of, of, of real gross overcorrection. But I think what the roof of, of the world want to do is authoritarian. And I think it's fundamentally illiberal. And I think it, uh, going back to the previous uh, point, it will backfire and it actually strengthens the hands of the very forces it claims to want to uh, counteract. Um, you can very easily say, look, they, they, really, they really do uh, intend to impose a minority rule over, uh, you know, a changing American society that they're uncomfortable with and they'll, they'll rule by force and they'll force you to 
minimize, you know, your sense of yourself and you were right all along as opposed to um, entering into dialogue or simply voting with your feet and pulling out your, your children from schools that don't represent your vision of academic excellence. I mean, these are ways to counter flawed ideas, but mm. I can't think of a situation in which banning or outlawing things made them less attractive, less potent. I mean, you can go all the way and you can become a kind of Vladimir Putin and you can, you can make it a crime for saying that there's a war happening in Ukraine, but I don't think that that actually wins the day. You know, you can do yeah. that by, by extreme force, but you can't convince people. You can, maybe you can deform some people so badly that they'll accept an authoritarianism, but you won't achieve anything like a liberal, vibrant, multi-ethnic society where, where people thrive. Uh, I think Chris Rufo represents a pretty dark vision. Um, and the politicians that he empowers and, uh, and does the kind of activist work for, I don't think that they represent where America is or should be headed. Yeah, it, it, uh, to bring out the comic book geek for a second. It reminds me of one of the last few panels of the comic book Watchmen. I don't know if you've ever uh, read it, but you know that something something heinous happens, uh, and the person who did it did it with good intentions, right? Did it with the intention of saving the world, and he basically asks this other character who who is basically like like a like a god, and he says, you know, like in the end, it was worth it, wasn't it? And he's, and the, you know, the God character basically says like, you don't understand nothing ever ends. It never ends. There is no mm -hmm. end. Right. And it, it, the reason why, you know, I thought of that now is because it seems to me that so many of these, these approaches and these, these tactics are short-sighted. Yeah. Pyrrhic victory is the best. Even if you implement a really precise law that is perfectly worded, doesn't have any kind of, you know, side effects that you don't want. Uh, and it works exactly the way you're intending or the way you're saying you want it to. You still have all of those people who wanted the thing in the first place that you've just now banned, right? What are right. you going to do with them? They're still going to exist. Growing. They're growing in number. Right. So what are we going to do, right? The work is still ahead of you. Like that did nothing basically, you know? No, it's um, force. I don't see it working, yeah, especially not, either. especially not in this, in this scenario like this. Yeah. I don't see it working. Yeah. Cause we're talking about ideas. Also fighting, fighting in such a way where you deform yourself and lose your principles and values in the process to defeat an enemy that you consider unprincipled. That's true. Yeah. There's no victory in that. I, I suppose, I mean, I, I was a little sympathetic to some of the early, um, like say, you know, the Tennessee bill, for example, that, that came out. I, I think, you know, obviously the devils and the details, like, you know, when people right now, you know, when, when, when in our discourse, it just seems like, are you for or against? And it's like, well, depends. It's like, even the abortion right. debate gets, gets reduced to I'm pro, I'm pro life or pro choice. As if, <laughs> you know, as if I, most people yeah. probably have a up till, you know, a certain time. Yeah, sure. That's really where most people are. And I, and I think, you know, even with these um, uh, attempts right now to, to, um, to, to, to ask, you know, is this the, the right approach in education, especially K to 12? And, and there is a bit of a moral panic with, you know, um, uh, when it comes to, to children. And, and, and I do hear the argument a lot that like, look, I, I'm against book banning, especially on the country level, on the societal level. But when it comes to children, you know, isn't there some sense of what is age appropriate, right? Um, sure. At, at, at the ages of seven and eight, really, should they be reading this book? Are they, are they ready to handle, right. um, you know? I agree with like, you. But there are so many ways that um, you can say this is not appropriate without um, trying to encode that in a kind of really anti-democratic and authoritarian law that um, is based on actual, you know, in, in some places is based on a minority imposing its vision over, over the democratic um, will. I mean, that is really, that's really disturbing to me, but, but there are so many ways that you can say this isn't appropriate. I mean, I, 
you're talking to someone here who believes that, you know, parents are responsible fundamentally for their children's education. I would never entrust my child's sexuality, view of her personal identity, um, understanding of how the world works to, 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 to people I barely know. I, I, that, that's my job. And if I don't like the curriculum at the school, I will try to become influential within the school community or I will put my child elsewhere. Um, some people don't have the option to homeschool or to pay for private school. I understand that, but you can you know, become involved in your school. And there are many things that stop short of asking an authority figure like Ron DeSantis to come in and remove books from the school library and even from the public libraries and even to remove mm -hmm. expressions from being able to be spoken. I mean, that's getting really kind of startlingly close to what you see in a place like Russia, you know, that you can't say things. This is profoundly disturbing to me. And, you know, and I, I'm surprised how, how quick a lot of us seem to be to, to part with fundamental basic uh, yeah. rights um, and, and, and principles of freedom of expression and things like this, um, freedom yeah. of uh, um, the right to be exposed to ideas that you even disagree with. How many of us want to be kind of ensconced in safe spaces and the degree to right. which, you know, the extremes on the right and the left kind of mirror each other in this um, retreat from the, from the uncomfortableness of the world and the need to be in spaces that only reaffirm their preconceived vision of how things ought to be. I mean, th th that's, that's not the way that I think you achieve um, a truly functional, multicultural, multi-ethnic society uh, yeah. based on liberal principles of tolerance and individual free expression. Well, that, that leads me actually to the, the problem that I think is undergirding so much of this, which is, which is miscommunication or, you know, whether it's deliberate or not, people are not yeah, quite, deliberate. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and some, some people are, are quite, just not quite understanding one another, right? Like we just had a, a conversation about the merits of a sort of woke, a woke perspective, right? And how it can be beneficial and how the absence of it can really lead to detrimental things or, or allow detrimental things to sort of go unnoticed. Right. But there, there's a faction of people who would refuse to even hear that. Right. Simply because the word woke was used. Right. It is automatically right, that's put why into I don't this like bin. The term, not because it's not a great term, but because it signals something that can make people right. shut down before yeah. they even hear what you're trying to say. But even the ideas, right. Like people, people have, on either either end of this horseshoe, people have m misconceptions about what exactly is being wanted and argued for, right? There are the, the loud voices who are bombastic and firebrand on, on either end who make it, they just create all the noise and it makes it difficult for people to actually see and understand like, oh, actually, when you boil it down, what you want is fairly reasonable. Maybe you have a bad idea of how to get it, but I can agree with the want. And then we can maybe move forward, right? But it, but it's impossible now because everything's so so flared up, right? We're so heightened. And then the the moral panic that um, Melissa just mentioned, you know, like we put kids in in there in the middle, and there's you know there's a target on their back as far as we're concerned, and that's going to make us even less likely to sit down calmly and rationally and just kind of think things through and figure out a way forward. It just becomes now nah, like take your swords out and you know we need to we need to destroy them because they're coming to ruin us, right? I don't know what we can do about this, except, you know, try our best not to contribute to that, you know, that fire, like stoking it, you know? Yeah, well, I think we can try our best not to contribute to stoking the fire. We can try to vote responsibly. I think mm -hmm. uh, so many people seem to want to vote for people that will punish their enemies, their perceived enemies, as opposed right. to voting for people who will govern as responsibly as possible. And that means potentially being flexible as opposed to being um, enforcers and punishers. Um, I don't think that we're well served by um, so much of the discourse on social media being dominated by um, activists on both the left and the right, as opposed to people who are fundamentally committed to solutions and to truth, as opposed to imposing a vision that has a preconceived, predetermined idea of what the right answer is. I think we need a lot more open-ended inquiry. And, and right. you know, the, the, the assurance that you see 
evinced by someone like Chris Rufo should immediately raise red flags, never expresses doubt or equivocation. And to me, that mirrors the kind of um, 100% certainty you get out of an Ibram X. Kendi or a Nicole Hannah-Jones. It's just activism straight through, not a devotion to... Um, to the pursuit of, uh, of truth and the, and, and the constant uh, acceptance of the fact that you might need to change your mind because you at no point possess all of the knowledge, all of the correct thinking on any given complicated set of questions that we're dealing with in these you know, chaotic multi-ethnic societies that we currently inhabit. I mean, th- such self-assurance, it immediately is a red flag to me. And I think that too much, like, you can't separate any of the stuff we've been talking about with that taking into effect the really destructive presence of social media and technology in our politics and our cultural lives. I mean, it's something that the algorithm strives to do, which is to present things in black and white terms that are able to maximally prime us for very emotional and often angry reactions. Uh, mm. And this is what the activists exploit and what the writers haven't figured out yet how to, how to maneuver around. Yeah. Well, to, you know, to, to be fair to, to, to Chris, I think he's been very explicit about his intentions, that his telos is in fact activism mm-hmm. and that his goal, and he states this many times, is winning and, you know, the emoji on his... Uh, handle is uh, crossing those swords. So I think he's very <laughs> clear uh, about about his goal. Um, I will say I, I do hear from parents a lot. And one of the things that they appreciate about his methods is I think there's a bit of urgency in the sense that like, you know, you said like, oh, I don't want my kids, um, you know, I, it's just my responsibility to educate them or it's my responsibility to talk to them about you know, birds and the bees and matters of sexuality. Um, but I think a lot of parents who um, who have spent, I don't know, the last, uh, especially in 2020 year, you know, locked up with their kids at home and actually finally being exposed on Zoom, um, what their kids are, are actually being taught um, and getting worried about it. I think a lot of them feel like they don't have the time. They don't have the time to debate this. And that mm-hmm. what Chris is doing is is giving them, um, I guess, not just, just the energy to, to uh, you know, go to these school board meetings and um, but but also if there is some form of proposed legislation either you're going to scare the school board in a you know reversing course um, I do think like for example one of the things that he does that is pretty useful is um, kind of he became this repository for anyone who was whistleblowing with, from within companies. Like the reason why we know what's going on in diversity trainings at like, I don't know, maybe 50 of the Fortune 500 companies or, or in some syllabi, you know, that, that is being leaked to him um, is, is actually he's just posting that. He's just, you know, hey, guys, Coca-Cola is teaching people to be less white. Like This is a screenshot. And, and, and insofar as that, I, I think um, I think people are, are finding that useful. I, I see what you're saying about the overcorrection. I, I, think, I think we can't discount the fact that, you know, if you're a teacher and now there are laws in place saying, you know, prohibiting you from, from, um, from you know, discussing certain topics because of how it might make other students feel, that that might radicalize you a bit further to, mm-hmm. to not just maybe learn more or dig in deeper if you were already kind of on the, on the edge. Um, but then also go around it. Right. And so, so the question, it it feels to me that your, your objection to the anti-CRT laws is actually not just from a moral standpoint, but also from a strategic standpoint that is actually just simply not effective. I, I, I find it morally problematic and I find it to be um, a pyrrhic victory at best if you get that stuff passed. I mean, as David French pointed out, a lot of that stuff can't stand up to 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 um, being challenged in court, first of all. Um, but even what you mean, like like racial affinity, like for example, segregating students, you don't think can st- because I mean that that is actually happening, right? Like there are there are now lessons that. Um, yeah, I object to racial affinity groups. I think that's crazy, but. Ron DeSantis or somebody coming in and outlawing it. First of all, like you said, I think that that's just pragmatically counterproductive because those teachers, you're basically creating an activist out of all of those teachers that you're 
um, not allowing to teach um, what they believe is um, morally justifiable uh, racial reasoning. Um, I just don't think that you can legislate that stuff out of people's um, conscience. It's not going to happen that way. You can, but maybe you can legislate actions, right? And, and we did legislate against segregation the first time. And look at what we're, we're now more segregated than we used to be. There's always a workaround. Uh, I mean, if you, and what's interesting is that, you know, I'm not an expert on the CRT stuff, but Chloe Valderi had a very interesting thread on how, um, and I'm aware a bit from, I guess, the piece that was in The New Yorker on Derek Bell. Derek Bell, one of the fathers of CRT, actually began to feel that his work on desegregation didn't serve um, his community's needs. Um, so while he put the needs of the kind of uh, victory of desegregation that would be symbolic and powerful above the actual schooling needs of Black families who needed a better education, and, and they weren't served by integrating into white schools where then, you know, white people pulled out and went into private schools and left the public institutions to decay and crumble. What they needed was just a quality education. And what actually happened in point of fact is forcing the kind of desegregation that happened led to years of increased uh, informal segregation where people simply pulled out. Does that make sense? I mean, we actually, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is something that actually has been documented quite a bit by Nicole Hannah Jones, who, you know, I really disagree with her on many things, but you know, you accept the truth from whoever utters it is what Maimonides said. I mean, we, the numbers show that we are in an extraordinarily segregated school system now. What I mean by that is not that desegregation was wrong, but it's just that it's not so clear cut that when you impose things by, by legislation, that that's the end of the story. Yeah. It seems to be like, uh, you know, the edification of that of that aphorism that politics is downstream of culture, right? Like it has to happen culturally first. Otherwise yeah. the, the politics won't take. Or it, it, it can, it, it can be a mixed bag what you get. But I think yeah. that the moral case coupled with the lack of um, obvious practicality makes it pretty easy for me to, to, to want to have nothing to do with the kind of bands that um, people like Ron DeSantis and Chris Rufo are, mm -hmm. you know, are, are, are arguing for. Um, I just think that you have to, you've, you, I do think, I do believe in the marketplace of ideas as, as corny as that might sound. I, I really do believe that, you know, most people um, want to do what they believe is right. Most people are pretty busy. Most people don't have time to immerse themselves in the finer points of every culture war issue, but they're reasonable and can be reached and appealed to. And that it's really right. imperative to, make compelling cases. You know, I've spent a lot of time wondering why, like ta Coates changed uh, the course of uh, American public discourse 10 years ago. Um, the, the case for reparations, I've never seen something like that in my adult life where you just come out and you take an issue that people have been familiar with for decades and haven't really budged on, haven't really cared to revisit. And you just write something so compelling that that basically the, the country changes. We're still dealing yeah. with the impact of the shift that he introduced with that piece. I mean, I have a lot of criticisms about the kind of you know shifts that ta Coates introduced, but I have but I have an enormous amount of respect for what a piece of persuasive writing can accomplish. Yeah, I think it's incredible, and I think that that should be the goal of what people who are engaged in public thinking who do have the time to kind of immerse themselves in the finer points of these debates. I think that's, that's what we should be aiming to do. Yeah. He, I mean, he's a brilliant writer. It's just objectively true. I think it cannot be taken away from him, whether you agree with his perspective or not. Uh, but I, uh, before we, before we wrap up here, I wanted to ask you because you are an expatriate, you are, uh, you know, an American living in France and a, you know, quote unquote mixed, race person. Um, you have, you know, that would already give you a sort of different perspective just because of the way you're treated and the way that maybe you're operating in the world. But then being in France, you know, you have this kind of outsider's view, right? An insider outsider's view of what's going on. And you're obviously still very tuned into the, the 
you know, the goings on in America, the political stuff, and then the social stuff. I'm wondering how you feel about whether you're living in France and being abroad and seeing us, you know, being in a different world while observing, you know, this American world. If that gives you any any kind of different perspective and what that perspective might be, and do you think that it it allows you to see things that maybe we can't because we're so steeped in everything? Well, I mean, I was just talking about this with uh, with Jonah Goldberg yesterday, and he made you know the point that fish aren't aware they're they're wet, right? <laughs> and I think that you know. One thing I always loved about James Baldwin's writing and the writing of other expats was that they became aware of being out of the water when they left America, the the water of American culture. And, you know, I I certainly took so many things for granted that I never, maybe never would have questioned if I didn't leave. I didn't have to come to Paris, but being in Western Europe is interesting because you see that there are other societies that live pretty well that have slightly different ways of doing things and you know for example we talked about france not being a perfect society but it being a society that thinks about race slightly differently and thinks about a multi-ethnic society differently and when i first moved here and found myself being asked you know what was my background and basically over and over again having to reiterate the log, the plantation logic of the one drop rule outside of the American context where people swam in that water, it started to sound more and more absurd to me mm. explaining why a drop of black blood makes a person black to people that didn't grow up in a slave society, people who had colonies, but never had slavery within their national borders and therefore didn't know anything about the laws of hypo descent or understand why <laughs> Uh, black meant unfree and therefore you can't inherit even if you have blue eyes and all of this stuff. Constantly having to reaffirm the American, uh, explain the rules of the all-American skin game, as Stanley Crouch termed it. I mean, it it just made that uh, fall apart for me. And so many things work that way. You know, I became aware in a way I never was before I left just how violent America can be how serious it is to have a society that has more guns than people in it, what that means, why a shooting like this mass shooting that just happened in Sacramento barely registers in the American media, but that would be the biggest story in any number of Western European nations for for the entire 2022 if that many people got shot on the street one night. You know, I mean, it's just something that barely registers in America. And that becomes shocking to you once you realize that the water is different elsewhere or that you're not even in water. Um, mm. at the same time, uh, to, to, to reiterate one point that I think is really true is that America is not all bad and living in other societies, even wealthy ones that have a lot going for them. You really can realize that, you know, I go back to America constantly and it's not just in the elite spaces, certainly in elite spaces, America really does a better job at integrating people from all different walks of life. Um, but also in non-elite spaces, you can be in Austin, Texas, or in Atlanta, Georgia, or in, you know, in, in Portland, Oregon, even, and you can encounter people, um, on the street, in the restaurant, in real spaces, encountering each other, uh, Latinos, Blacks, Asians, Whites, actually living with each other in ways that you don't see, uh, yeah. everywhere. And it works pretty well. And people have respect for each other and people really have come a long way. America has assimilated lots of people. And I think we talk about all the ways that it doesn't work all the time, but I don't think that we're nearly proud enough of how nothing like this has ever happened before a society, like a a melting pot like this, it really does function a hell of a lot, a hell of a lot at the time. Um, Yeah. One thing that I miss, uh, you know, pre from the pre pandemic world, is kind of noticing on the New York City subway how how yeah. much how much exactly what you're saying is true, right? You see a guy in you know a Wall Street guy in a business suit right next to a food delivery guy you know with his bicycle, right? And they're just we're coexisting, we're mashed together in this metal tube, and we're all just trying to move forward, right? Like I, it's a yeah. beautiful metaphor for what's going on, but. I gave a talk in Austin, Texas. There were whites, Filipinos, Latinos, a few black people, 
I mean, the crowd was the crowd was as mixed as I could believe it was. Um, just one Tuesday night in Austin, Texas, and I thought, you know, in many ways they're already living. These were people that were, you know, were interacting with each other in a way that made me think. In many ways, they're already living the society that I'm trying to call call forth um, rhetorically uh, on the ground. It already is there. I think we need to embrace it and accept it more, and also, you know, not become complacent. But but I do think that there needs to be more of a kind of a positive proclamation of American strengths that really you don't see in the discourse very much at all. You know, it's, and especially it needs to come from the left, from a liberal kind of voice, you know, a kind of, to bring it back to Albert Murray or Ralph Ellison, a kind of pro-democratic, pro-American, you know, uh, pro-omni-American argument for, for what this society does get right. Um, I think that could be one of those compelling ideas that maybe could change the discourse. Maybe you're going to write it, Angel. I mean, <laughs> you've got a lot of energy, I think. Um, uh, I don't know, man. That, not, I think not... needs to be articulated. I think there's so yeah, much yeah. complaining and negativity and tearing down. We need a vision that brings us together. Camille is always very eloquent on this. You have to, at some point, you can't just react and you can't just critique. You have to actually present a positive vision. You can't just ban. You can't just restrict. You need to put forth a positive vision of what the compellingly inclusive and, and, and flourishing society looks like. And then, and then go about the business of persuading people to join you in, in, in realizing that vision. I actually think we're, we're doing that with uh, fair I think you are doing that fair. Cor- cor- I think yeah, you are doing with- and fair is actually more multi-ethnic than I think a lot of its critics realize. Yeah, actually, that's yeah. true. We, we had, when we went for our retreat recently um, in, in Florida, I was, I was actually shocked. <laughs> um, and it was organic, you know, because we're not optimizing for it. We're not seeing right. we're going to select people because of representation. It actually really just kind of shook out that way, which is, I don't know, it's just so pleasing. But yeah, I do recommend people to check out um, FAIR Story and, and the FAIR curriculums that we're putting out, which I, I think the goal is to do exactly what what, um, what you just said, is to offer a more positive um, vision. And, and that is, you know, inclusive and complete. Um, Thomas, I'm going to ask you the last question before we sign off. Um, our focus here is, is to provide pro-human alternatives or approaches to um, the discourse, especially on you know, very hot-button topics. Um, how, what does pro-human mean to you, and how, does, how can everyday people kind of you know, um, reach that, approach these issues in, in a way that, that is more in line with, with that value? That's a great question. I mean, and prohuman is a great term that I think, um, you know, it causes me to reflect. I think uh, people should ask themselves or be asked to ask themselves what it would look like to be prohuman. I think that that would mean that we would all have the burden of not allowing ourselves to engage with and see each other as um, stereotypes or as a uh, group avatars of groups or, or, um, embodiments of arguments that we disagree with, but as actually like fully complex and paradoxical and complicated and contradictory individuals who probably like, you know, Barack Obama said, love their kids, want to have a better tomorrow than today was, you know, basically want what they think of as, as a, as a good life, even if, from our perspective, their conception of the good is flawed. Um, for me, that pro-human injunction is kind of a call to be more tolerant because you're recognizing, you're extending the kind of uh, grace and benefit of the doubt that we, off, that we, that we always extend to ourselves in, in comprehension of our own full humanity. You're extending that to other people instead of reducing them to caricatures and stereotypes. So well said. And thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for listening to Fair Perspectives. If you'd like to support the show, you can do it by subscribing on YouTube and on your favorite podcast platform and leaving us a positive rating and review. You can also access exclusive podcast content, such as Q&As and bonus episodes, by visiting us and signing up at fairperspectives.org. For weekly fair news and opinion pieces by members of the fair community, visit our substack at fairforall.substack.com. 
and tune into Fair News Weekly wherever you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to join or support the pro-human movement, visit us at fairforall.org slash join us. Thanks again and see you next time.